you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse 4 in just a minute and make our way through the end of this section, chapter 2 through verse, uh, verses 4 through verse 10. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to use the one in the chair in front of you or follow along on the screen. We'll have passages of Scripture up there as well. As we continue to work this, through this particular passage of Scripture, we're taking a look again at the mystery of God and the kind of salvation that He gives us. God's gift of salvation is the focus of this passage of Scripture in so many ways. In that first short section of chapter 2, we dealt with last time, verses 1 through 5, we dealt with how sin works, with what it does to us. And we watched this two-step process occur. Paul says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, but God is rich in mercy. And so God grants us these amazing gifts even though we are dead in our sins. So, God, so Paul's thoughts now moved more toward the direction of what God gives in salvation, what the gift itself is like, and then what the gift itself actually does within us. So we're going to grow comfortable with this language today. We receive the gift, the grace of salvation. So salvation is a gift, but it's a very specific and a very powerful kind of gift in our lives. God gives it, but we need to receive it is the language of Scripture. This gift of salvation not only puts us in right relationship with Jesus Christ, it actually changes our lives in really significant ways. So guys, when we receive the gift of salvation, our lives move from being held by this world to being held by Christ. Now that's really interesting language, but it's language that Paul likes. He says it in this passage, he says it in other passages. When we belong to Christ, when we become children of God, our lives move to being held with Him in the heavenly places. It's incredible language, but what does that mean? And we're going to get to talk about that this morning. The gift of salvation also has these intended consequences to them. It's not just a gift that God gives and it just sort of lies follow through the rest of our earthly lives. It has intended consequences. It turns out, guys, that you and I were created, literally created, to live a certain kind of life that is filled with the power and the presence of God. What does that new life look like? How is it different than another way of life? And that's something that the rest of Ephesians 2 and 3 and 4 move into actually quite specifically. But overall this morning, the, thoughts that, the thought that's going to help hold us all together, what we're going to watch unfold is this, that we're going to watch God's generosity and God's glory in salvation. God's generosity in salvation. We're saved by this gift that is given to us regardless of our sense of whether we are worthy of it or not. None of us are worthy, but whether we feel like that or not, it is this gift, this generous gift that God gives. And then God's glory is seen in our salvation. Guys, this is a really cool thought in Scripture. Saved people in a vibrant church are signposts to the glory of God. Not to how great we are, not to how magnificent and clever we can be, but they're signposts to the glory of God. So let's begin reading. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to pick up in verse 4, just as so that we grab some of the context and make our way through verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 goes like this. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Before we start digging through the passage sort of section by section, I want to make sure that we understand something about what we just read. This this passage contains one of these core concepts in Scripture when it comes to the notion of salvation. So it's critical to understanding how the Christian view of salvation worked, and it happens here in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. If we're going to understand the Christian doctrine of salvation, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, is one of these verses that's right at the very core of our understanding. We are saved by grace, the gift that God gives, through faith, putting our trust in Jesus Christ, and not by our own works. Now, we're going to get a chance to dig in this in just a couple of minutes, but we need to make sure that we understand that this verse is right at the center, right at the very heart of this passage in our understanding of how salvation works. But if we go back to the end of verse 5 and kind of roll through the beginning of verse 6, Paul says, it is by grace that you have been saved, and God has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So God saves us, and God raises us. It's this really cool language. It's really beautiful movement of what God does for us in salvation. Now, it is not uncommon for people to ask the question, saved from what? What does that mean? mean? Why do I need saving? I don't feel like I need saving. I don't understand exactly what it is that I need saving from. Well, here's how Scripture kind of lays out this story, and here's how we're going to talk about what it means to be saved and why it is so important for us. So we are saved, as the Scripture tells us, we are saved from our slavery to sin. We are saved from Life now without God, and we are saved from an eternity without God. These three fundamental concepts as Scripture talks to us about why salvation is necessary and what it does. So we are saved from our slavery to sin. We touched on this concept a little bit last week because Paul uses this really stark language. He begins chapter 2, verse 1 by saying, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He said that's the way that we lived. All of us once lived according to the power of sin, in the death of sin itself. So this language is powerful. In Ephesians 2, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. The book of Romans says we are slaves to our sin. We are slaves to unrighteousness. And the idea biblically is this. We cannot not be slaves to sin without Jesus Christ. It's just where our hearts lie. It's just the inclination of our lives. Our master is our brokenness and sinfulness. Now listen, this does not mean that anybody without Jesus Christ is just flat out a serial killer, right? That's not what this means. But it does mean that in the end, no matter what that person's life is like, no matter what my life is like, if I reject Jesus Christ, in the end, I'm going to reject the existence of God. I'm going to reject the work of Jesus Christ. I'm going to reject the role of God as Lord in my life. That's what sin does to me. If our enemy can separate me from my God simply by making me think I'm too good a person to need salvation, my enemy will do that. But I'm going to reject God, his existence, and his role as Lord in my life. That's slavery to sin. So a very nice and self-described moral person may, re may reject the existence and the lordship of Jesus Christ, and we're lost in our sins if we find ourselves in that place. So Christ saves us from our slavery to sin, and then salvation saves us from living life now without God. If we, ex if we reject the existence of Christ, the lordship 
of Jesus Christ. If we reject the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit, who is even here with us this morning, then we are left to our own devices in this world. We are left to the devices and the cleverness and the work that is in this world now. And I don't know if you guys watch the same news that I watch, but I don't want to be left under the power of this world and the way this world works. That's life now without God, left to our own devices in the strength of this world. The good life in Jesus Christ begins with salvation by grace. That God accepts us and transforms us and begins to change us and begins to exchange my broken life for the life that God gives me. This is what we mean when we talk about the good life or the blessed life in Jesus Christ. If we reject all of that, then the only place I have to go is that the good life is some sense of generalized moralism, some kind of performance-ism. I have to be a good person. I have to be a good person more than maybe 50% of the time. I have to follow a certain set of standards in this life. Well, who says what is good? Who says who's a good person? And by the way, guys, that's always a moving target in our culture as well. That's life now without God. And then we find out that without God in this life, that we have no particular hope of life beyond this one. There was a few weeks ago um, an article in the Atlantic online, and it was fascinating. It was about a philosopher by the name of Herbert Finnegret who had come to the end of his life. And he's actually a very thoughtful man. He had written all kinds of fascinating things, um, things that I found fascinating. But he was also an avowed atheist, and he was coming to the end of his life. And as his physical body was falling apart, his grandson, who is a filmmaker, decided to document his grandfather's end of life. And so all of this is coming out in the Atlantic and in the documentary and so forth. Here's part of what the article says. In his 1996 book about death, Herbert Finnegret argued that fearing one's own demise was irrational. Now, this is a standard atheist response to the problem of death. Well, when you die, you just disappear. You're gone. There's, there's nothing left to worry about. So there's, death is nothing to worry about. It's just a natural part of life. You just cease to exist. That's the standard line about death from an atheist. He goes on to say, when you die, he wrote, there is nothing. Why should we fear the absence of being when we won't be there ourselves to suffer it? Right? So that's his point of view. But now he's 97. And now his body is falling apart. And now he doesn't have much longer to go. <clears throat> and here's, what he, here's how it goes. 20 years later, facing his own mortality, the philosopher realized that he had been wrong. It haunts me, the idea of dying soon. Whether there's a good reason or not, I walk around often and ask myself, what is the point of it all? There must be something I'm missing. I wish I knew. That's heartbreaking. To come to that point, and you've been saying and arguing with people for over 20 years, there's nothing to worry about. And then you face it, and you walk around your room thinking there must be something I miss. God saves us from that. He saves us from life today without Him. And then salvation also saves us from an eternal destiny without God. Let this sink in for a second. Every human being is created in the image of God. Every human being. And part of what that means is that every human being is created with an eternal soul. So what that means is every human who has ever been alive is still alive. Think about that for a second. Every human being who has ever lived is still alive. Jesus Christ saves us from eternity without Him. Here's part of how Jesus Christ talks about how important this is in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. Jesus says this, 
<clears throat> and if your hand or your foot cause you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life, meaning eternal life with him, crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet, and be thrown into the eternal fire. All right, this is a hyperbolic story. He's not saying literally cut off your hands and pluck out your eyes, but he's saying it is more important for you to get rid of that kind of sin so that you can enter life with me for all of eternity rather than staying trapped in that sin, holding on to that sin, and entering into eternity without me. That's how important this is, Jesus is saying. So salvation saves us from our slavery to sin, from life now without God, and saves us from eternity without God. And that's all a sense of what salvation saves us from, but in that we can see what salvation gives us, what the promise of salvation is. Instead of slavery to sin, there is now the freedom to obey God and live the life that he is giving to us. Instead of now life without God, what salvation gives us is the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can live this life now with God. And instead of the concern of life without Him for all of eternity, salvation guarantees our eternity with Jesus Christ. That's powerful stuff, guys. By grace you have been saved, Paul says. And God has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. So God also raises us up with him and seats us with Jesus Christ. Now this is cool language that Paul uses. It's very provocative. So our lives, that eternal piece of us that exists beyond whatever happens to this physical body, that eternal peace of me is now held securely by Jesus Christ because I am his child. And nothing can happen to that. No one can take that away from him. My life is now raised with Christ in the heavenly places. And if you are a child of God, so is your life as well. Without Christ, my life is held by this world. With Christ, my life is now held with him. Paul says something similar in the book of Colossians. In Colossians chapter 3, the first four verses, listen to how he uses the same language, the same ideas, and then talks about since this is true, now here's what we do as followers of Christ. Colossians 3, beginning in verse 1, goes like this. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on this earth. For you have died with Christ, is the idea, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So Paul says, since this is the case, since now... You are being held by Christ in the heavenly places. Life is going to change. I need you to start thinking about different things. I need you to start putting different, different things inside of your head, your heart, your life. Because there's going to come a day that when he shows up, so will you. <laughs> because you belong to him. One of my favorite authors, Dallas Willard, a philosopher, he writes a lot about spiritual formation and discipleship. He says something really provocative from time to time. He's talking to Christians, and he says this. In Christ, this world is a safe place to be. That's a really provocative thought. Now, that idea does not mean that in Christ, everything is going to go your way. He's not saying everything is going to be fine from here on out. Clearly, that is not the case. But listen to the language that we've been reading here in Ephesians 2 and Colossians chapter 3. That thing that guarantees your eternity is being held by Jesus Christ, and nobody and nothing can actually take that away from him. And there is nothing in this world that can happen to me that cannot be fixed and rectified in Jesus Christ, even if that means it's going to be fixed and rectified on the other side of eternity. That's what that means. That even in this world, if I belong to Jesus Christ, this is a perfectly safe place for me to be. Follow God however He wants to lead me. 
This image of raising is deliberate. We've been raised and given to Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has been given to us. (laughs) The power that Christ showed over death itself now belongs to the children of God. And we've been raised with him and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. All of these big ideas, these glorious realities about what it means to be saved, the gift that God is giving us. He saved us and he raises us. And then in verse 7, Paul sneaks this idea in. And this kind of idea shows up a few times in the book of Ephesians if you're looking for it. Listen to how verse 7 goes. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I love this thought. Why does God do all of this? So that he can show the immeasurable riches of his glory and grace. God is at work within us, not only granting us salvation, bringing us to himself, putting us in the family of God, giving us his gift. He is not just at work doing that. He is also at work showing off his glory, showing off his greatness, showing off his kind of generosity toward people like you and me. So here are these thoughts again we're holding on to this morning, that God is generous in his salvation giving the gift of salvation to dead sinners, people who can't achieve it, people who can't demand it, and God gives it, but he just gives it because he is generous. Giving us the power, his power for life here and now and allowing us to partake in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the magnificent generosity of God toward us in salvation. And God is glorious in salvation. Because God's glory is absolute and because it is perfect, it only makes sense to make a big deal about God. There is nothing arrogant, there is nothing wrong in talking about the greatness and the glory of God because of how perfect and absolute it is. It only makes sense to make a big deal about God. So God's kindness toward you and me deserves to be known. So God is at work doing this inside of our lives. He's at work doing this inside of us individually, in our families, in our churches. Here's part of how Paul talks about some of this in the book of Titus. As he writes this young pastor, he puts it like this. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, But according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. I love the Trinitarian language in a passage like this. This is what God is doing. This is what he's given to us in Jesus Christ. And he empowers us with the presence of his Holy Spirit here and now. This is beautiful language about the loving kindness of God, Paul says as he writes to Titus. So God is at work showing the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Then we hit this verse 8 here in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So very simply, we are saved by grace. It is a gift that God gives. God offers it to whosoever will. God's grace, this gift, is offered to everyone all the time. I know that's a radical thought, but this is how this kind of gift works. There's a 50-cent theological word that we use to describe this kind of grace from time to time. It's called prevenient grace. Now, everybody say prevenient. Now, work that into a normal conversation this week some point. You know, just nod your head and rub your beard and go, yeah, prevenient. The word simply means to go ahead of us. God's grace goes before us 
and is always available. This gift that God gives is prevenient. It's gone ahead of me, and it's working toward me. It is, it, it is extending toward me. That's the language that we lo- used last week, that God's grace is extended toward dead people so that then we can come alive. And that's how grace has to work because we can't do it. It has to be Him. So God's grace goes ahead of us and is always available to all of us. And we must receive it is the language of Scripture. God does not force salvation upon us. He offers it to us. Listen to how Paul talks about when he writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 5. For if because of one man's trespass, and he's talking about Adam's fall and our sinfulness, for if because of one man's trespass, Death reigned through that man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So for those who receive the gift of salvation, he says, he says it's an abundance of grace. It's a free gift of righteousness. That we reign in life now through Jesus Christ. And the way Paul talks about this here, the gift of grace, and that we receive it through faith. Faith is just trust now in Jesus Christ. I have decided now to trust that the way of Jesus is right and real. I have decided now that the way of Jesus is accurate and true, and I will now follow this Jesus instead of following and trusting in all of these other ways of life. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. This is through faith, not of your works. It is the gift of God, he says. And then there are two things that are true. Watch how verse 8 moves into verse 9. Not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works. He, keeps, he wants to make sure we understand that. <laughs> it is not a result of works so that no one may boast. Because God gives it, these next two things are true. It isn't our works that secure salvation, and we can only boast about God. So it's not our works that give us salvation. Our good behavior, however good it is, however dynamic it is, however consistent or inconsistent it is, our demands, our expectations of God, none of that compel God to give me salvation. None of it can, but He freely gives. Now, this doctrine of grace, the free gift of grace, is a stunning truth that belongs only to the Christian faith. Now listen, I'm going to make another serious uh, statement here, another broad and sweeping statement. Some of you may disagree, but you're going to go home and you're going to think about it and you're going to realize Pastor Phil was right again, okay? Just so you know. I'm just kidding, right? This is a doctrine that belongs only to the Christian faith. There is no other faith that has this doctrine of grace There is no other non-faith that has this doctrine of grace. That we are not designed to be good people in order to attain a certain level of acceptance. We are dead, and God gives us life. And let me tell you something else I've discovered about the doctrine of grace. It's offensive to people. It's offensive. And it's offensive in really interesting ways. Years ago, I had an opportunity to be a part of a kind of ecumenical panel downtown. We sat down and, and did some Q&A, and actually it was a really wonderful experience. I, I sat between the senior pastor of First United Methodist downtown, Bishop Sheridan. There was a rabbi from the Air Force Academy there. Uh, there was one of the leading elders of the Mormon church was on this panel as well. So we're talking back and forth about culture and issues and really actually had a wonderful time. Afterward, I ended up in this rather pointed conversation with a guy um, who considered himself Jewish, cons- conservative Jewish, and he just tells me this. We had a good conversation, but he was very straightforward about this. He said, grace offends me because in my faith, all you have to do is be a nice person and do the right kinds of things, and then you will be accepted by God. Why is it that Christians say you have to accept Jesus Christ? Why is it that you have to receive this gift from Christ? All you have to do is be a nice person. That sounds nice on the surface. And by the way, 
That is the doctrine of salvation that belongs to every other religious faith. That is, to use the phrase, the doctrine of salvation that is used by people of no faith at all, they all believe the same thing, be a nice person and you will be okay. It is a burden no human being can bear. It will absolutely crush the human soul. We can't do it. It sounds nice. It's not nice. What does it mean to be good? Who defines what it means to be moral? Who says this behavior is right or this belief is right? If you've ever felt the pressure on social media to like or not like something based on what other people will think that you actually like because you punched that button, you have felt the pressure of a culture that says you have to be a very specific kind of person for us to accept you as good. That's a crushing burden. Nobody can, nobody can live that. and No one is saved by that. Do I have to be better? Do I have to be nice 50 percent of the time, 51 percent of the time. The human soul does all kinds of things to justify whether or not I am a moral person. And here's one of the things the, heart, the human heart does. In order for me to believe that I am a good person, I have to define everything I do as good. Does that make sense? I can't now believe that the things that I do are bad. I have to believe that the things that I do now are good. That way I can tell other people I'm a good person. Because I'm living under the perpetual flywheel of performancism. I have to do it over and over and over and over. But Jesus Christ walks into the scene. And Paul explains to us what Jesus does. He says, it's not by your works. It is a gift that God gives. It is not our works. And then I love this thought so that no one can boast. None of us can boast and say, I have achieved this. None of us can boast and say, I am the super-duper individual that God has accepted because of how good I am. None of us can do that because none of us received salvation that way. All of us received it the same way, the gift of grace and trust in Jesus Christ. And listen, guys, if I boast about myself... I will never live up to my boasting and I will be crushed. But if I boast about God, I will never find the end of his glory. Does that make sense? If I boast about myself, I will never live up to it. But if my life is about boasting about God, I will never reach the end of his glory. He is always greater than all of the glory I give him. Guys, everything about the saved soul needs to say, look at Jesus. Think of that as a way to give context to your life with Jesus Christ this week. How can everything about my life tell everybody else around me, look at Jesus, look at Jesus. John the Baptist sees Jesus one day and is talking about who he is, and he finishes one particular little conversation in John chapter 3 by saying, he must increase and I must decrease. If my life is about boasting about me, then my life implicitly or explicitly becomes, I must increase. <laughs> I must increase. You must see me a certain way. You must perceive me a certain way. You must feel a certain way about me because I must increase. That is not the life of the saved soul. I realize what I have been given. So now my life needs to be about Jesus Christ. Tim Keller, wonderful author and pastor, he put it like this, talking about the difference, and he uses the words religion and gospel. He says this, religion makes us proud of what we have done. The gospel makes us proud of what Jesus has done. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We were created for the glory of God here on earth. However it is, God has created you. You and I 
were created for the glory of God. Paul says we discover that beforehand, God put us together like this. And now that we are children of God, now that we have been raised and placed with Christ, now we see that our lives were created for his glory. It's incredible. Guys, the the movement of this thought, the order of the steps is critical. Grace is given and our lives follow. Grace is given and then our lives follow. That's why verse 8 comes before verse 10. That's how math works. It's awesome. (laughs) Grace is given, our lives follow. A couple of other thoughts, again, taken from the way that Tim Keller talks about religion and grace, but it's, it's very clear. Religion is, I obey, therefore I am accepted. My behavior is motivated out of fear and insecurity. So I have to, I have to, I have to. I blew it, so now I have to. I blew it again, so now I have to. I tried, I wanted to, I really did, but I blew it, so I have to try harder and harder. If my acceptance is based on how I behave, then my behavior is motivated now out of fear and insecurity. On the other hand, what we've been reading is the gospel. The gospel is, I am accepted, therefore I obey. My behavior can now be motivated out of love and joy. How different would my day-to-day life be if I grabbed hold of that and my behavior shifted from fear and anxiety and performance, and I've got to do this and say this, and people have to see me a certain way and think about me in a certain way. What if all of that could just get flushed down the toilet it belongs in, and we can actually live now actually acting out of love and joy and peace and thanksgiving to God? How different would our lives become? But this is the gospel. This is good news. I can now live out of thanksgiving to God. I can now act out of love and joy and peace. The fruit of the Spirit can actually be a part of all that I do. You and I were created by God to live our lives in Jesus Christ, to take part in the life that He lived, and to benefit again from His resurrection from the dead. I come to Christ dead in my sins, receive his generous gift of salvation, then discover on the other side that I was designed for his glory all along. It's a beautiful story that's being told. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden now we can become Pharisees, now we can become moralistic legalists. That's not what this means. It means we become now people who are able to live out of love and gratitude, joy and peace. The fruit of the Spirit can really become a part of our lives so that we can honor Christ with absolutely all that we do. There's a little TV show that Heather and I have kind of gotten into, and it's a really pleasant, sweet show. It's called The Repair Shop. It's this little old BBC show. It's great. And uh, it's just this shop that's full of these craftspeople, and all they do is they repair antique things that have fallen apart. They actually have these two ladies there, and all they do is they repair torn up teddy bears and old dolls. It's really amazing. This clockmaker and these furniture restores, it's really a cute show. But you look at their work desks, their benches, and they're just this jumbled mess of tools and equipment that I just, I, you know, I look at these things, I have no clue what any of these things do, but these people walk in and they've got this antique clock that was handed down from great-great-grandpa and it's broken, it doesn't work anymore, and they hand it to the guy who repairs clocks. And he goes, oh yeah, I know what this is and I know what to do with it. And if that clock were handed to me behind that desk, you'd hand me that clock, I'd grab some random tool and I would just beat that thing. You might as well just throw the clock in the garbage before you gave it to me. But you put that clock and the right tool in the hand of the master and something that was broken becomes beautiful again. 
something that doesn't work the way it was supposed to, now works exactly how it was designed. Now, remember what Paul said. You've been raised with Christ. He has you. He has you. And this is the kind of thing that can happen with our lives if they are in the hands of the Master. Let's pray.